Hello and welcome to the Miami Documentary on Housing and Climate Justice Conference session. Um, my name is Ronald Baez. I'm going to be your moderator today. I am a uh, filmmaker and the Miami producer for Raising Liberty Square, which is the documentary that will be guiding our conversation for today. I do want to introduce um, our panelists, if I may. Uh, we have Philip and Hattie Walker. Uh, they are the founders of Project Liberty Square Family and Friends, and they are former residents of Liberty Square. Aaron McKinney, who is a community advocate and a real estate developer born and raised in Liberty City. Uh, Daniela Pierre, who is an affordable housing advocate and the president of the Miami-Dade branch of the NAACP. And Katya Esson, who is the director and producer of Raising Liberty Square, a feature film about climate gentrification in Miami. So all of you guys, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to this panel. Um, to get us started, I do want to just give some context with a trailer. So Aaron, if you don't mind putting up the trailer for Raising Liberty Square, please, for our audience. I'm a single mother of seven. I have a difficult decision to make whether I will stay or whether I will go. Liberty Square is the heart. And when you destroy the heart, you destroy the people. So where is the people going to go? When they came to build Miami, they wanted it to be this beachfront paradise. So what they did was push the people of color, black folks, to the middle of the city, which sits on a ridge. Why are you seeing what it's going to be? Why? Why are there no people that look like me? This is the next step in the process. Somehow or another, Mr. Milo, the plans change. How do I get a place to live? How? What are you going to do? You think you're going to be able to call Milo and ask him for an apartment? <laughs> a good front for my um, staff and I put on a good front for my children but it does bother me I have to go to sleep at night and I'm wondering like what would happen to us if we do lose the place I'm not disconnected from these kids I used to be one of these kids why why you love the kids why you do that because when I grew up no one told me they love me I'm in war stage willing to fight for these children and my community We're starting to see developers who have historically only did business on the beach or in affluent communities are now coming in and fighting over housing projects that sit smack dab in the middle of our city. I'm a firm believer of mixed income development and breaking up concentrated poverty. And I'm not saying this because I work for the firm. I'm actually, I am impressed with our plan. I've heard everything from, you know, Aaron, you're just here to take a check every two weeks or, you know, you're a house nigga, something like that. What color you want her on to be? I need to know so I can start Go. getting stuff. <laughs> we can't even get a meeting with the people that made all these promises. That's why I'm asking you, how you know they're going to keep their word? It's in the contract.
Miami is ground zero for sea level rise. We are the example of climate gentrification. When I was a child, my grandfather always would say, they're gonna come take Liberty City because we don't flood. So as you can see, we're going to be exploring um, some pretty big topics uh, surrounding climate gentrification, cultural and historic preservation, and housing with our panelists, who hopefully we can get back on here. There's Aaron. Um, and just so everyone has a sense of what's going to happen, uh, we'll be exploring some discussions, and then we will move um, into the audience questions after the fact. But if I may uh, start with Philip and Hattie Walker, um, just a quick question for y'all. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Liberty Square? Why is this a significant place? And why did you organize the Liberty Square Project Friends and Family Reunion for residents and former residents? Okay, I'll answer the first part and then Philip will do the second part. <laughs> for sure. Okay. Liberty Square was significant because it was it was so beautiful. You have to realize these people were coming from not having running water in their houses and the landscape was out of sight. It was gorgeous. I mean, people was on a waiting list to get in there. At one time, they even had a grocery store. They had a church at one time. They had a school at one time, but most of all, they had unity with the family it was just something that you don't see now nowhere you know unless it's in a private home and people when they moved out of liberty square at that time they moved out to ownership they didn't stay there as forever you know and that's that was that's what was so significant to me okay now philip would talk about you know the organization of it well we was we we had got used to each other going to funerals. Every every time we looked around, we was going to a funeral for one of our neighbors from the project. So we so we decided that we would form the project reunion, and that was in well, oh, I think it was around about about two thousand six. Yeah, about two thousand six, mm -hmm. and from there. We we decided that we will go back into the project and help help give give our scholarships, clothes, whatever. We wanted to give some back because the project was really a uh, 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 the place where 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 you can you can go be safe, but later on, what happened to it? I also, in 2013, we, we organized where we became a nonprofit organization. We became, right. grew into, from oh. just meeting socially to doing something to give back to our roots. Yeah, you formalized that, that organization. Yes. Well, yes. Mm -hmm. well, what's it called? A 301? Yeah, 301C. Yes. For sure. No, that's interesting. It's, it's very clear. Um, so, how is. Uh, how is the nonprofit moving now? Is it is it is it kind of like going in that direction? Is it um, you're, you're maintaining those those uh, programs that you've been doing? Oh yes, oh. yes. By law, you know, by guidelines of, of being a five hundred one three C, there are certain things that you have to do to maintain that status. So not only do we do, we work in conjunction with other uh, organizations. Oh, yes. You know, because you know, together you stand and divided you fall. So we are a small unit, but we have a big heart. And you know, being nonprofit, we don't even charge ourselves. <laughs> we yeah. give, you know, we don't even have dues for ourselves. And we enjoy giving back because this is from how it, it you know, we look at from whence we've come, you know, and we have judges, lawyers, you name it, that came from Liberty mm -hmm. Square. We're so proud to give back in That's any way we can. That's excellent. It's good to know that the uh, Liberty Square Project Friends and Family Reunion is something that you can support. Um, 
right now. If I can, though, I'd like to move on to Daniela Pierre, who we know is a wonderful housing advocate. Um, Daniela, what is happening across Miami with public housing? We're talking about, Philip mentioned that change that happened from when he was growing up in Liberty Square to what Liberty Square might look like today. How does Liberty Square fit into the context of public housing across the city? Thank you so much for the question. Um, and I would say, you know, 85 years later, we're back at Liberty Square with the redevelopment. And I would say due to an age in housing stock, there is a common consensus that redevelopment, revitalization, and a restoration inclusive of Liberty Square and all things Liberty City has been needed for a very long time and particularly for public housing units within that area. However, what is happening or at least what appears to be happening as it relates to Liberty City um, appears to be an organized takeover and some element of displacement. Displacement by families who are continually being priced out of the only area they have called home. Increasingly, public housing, those units that are coming back online, are being at a rate where it prices out our seniors and our low income families. So it's becoming an area that had a need for revitalization for a very long time, but what is being redesigned for today isn't as accessible or affordable as it was in the past. So we see that going on within Liberty City and particularly within Liberty Square. Again, you've had families where generationally that's the only place and space they were able to call home for a number of reasons. But because of the times that we're in now, and some would say it's by design, but I would also say it's inclusive of antiquated policies that continue to have um, families become priced out and marginalized as it relates to moving housing forward within the area. So those are the things that are um, happening, at least on a high level overview perspective when it comes to uh, Liberty Square <laughs> and Liberty City in particular. Yeah, that's it's interesting because you mentioned um, kind of historic policy on one side. And then I know uh, Katya, the film director, producer of Raising Liberty Square, you've actually gotten really into how that historic policy has transformed in modern time. Um, and we, we, we call this thing or this thing is coined in Miami uh, climate gentrification. Can you tell me a little bit what about what climate gentrification is? And also, just so we have some, some, some background, why did you make this movie? Thanks, uh, Ronald. Um, yes, this, this new term climate gentrification was, as you said, actually coined in Miami, but it manifests itself differently in, in different cities or in different places. Miami has a very specific form of, of uh, and I still go like this, climate gentrification, right. um, um, because Miami is basically ground zero for sea level rise in the world, some argue. You know, it's really one of the most, not the most vulnerable city to sea level rise. Um, and historically, communi communities of color have been pushed inland, away from the beaches, away from the precious coastline, but they were pushed on, on a ridge that exists in Florida. So these, these communities now sit on much higher ground. And the beaches are extremely wealthy, 
but they are also extremely low lying. You know, sometimes really literally one foot or zero above sea level. So they are the first ones going to be, you know, I mean, they're trying to do all kinds of stuff, raising roads, doing pumps, but I mean, the beaches, right. they're going to go. And um, so now these wealthier people, but definitely investors and, and um, developers are looking inland for many reasons, less uh, cheaper insurances, but also looking for the future. And, and the as Daniela was saying, the, uh, the communities, the, the, the historic communities in these places are being pushed out. And that's climate gentrification. Um, and when I started this film, when I started raising Liberty Square, which at that point I didn't have that title yet in my head, but it's, it's, a, pl it's a play on this Liberty Square Rising, and the title is Raising, R-A-Z. Yeah. Um, but that came later because I really started uh, with a purely historic interest in the, pro in the, in the projects. You know, Moonlight, the movie Moonlight had just come out. I had studied here in the late 80s, mid 90s, did not know anything about this uh, um, community and then learned about that, that it was supposed to be raised to the ground. And I realized, I, I learned it is one of the first segregated uh, segregated uh, public housing projects in America, one of the largest um, built during the New Deal. So the, my European heart was like, what do you mean you're going to tear this down? I just couldn't believe it. And Phil, Philip, remember, we were, you know, when I met you, you were still at, at the point like we have to preserve all this. That's how I said, st yeah. I, st I st like, oh, my God, we have to preserve yes. anything. Yes. I just, we have to preserve it. It was a historic perspective. Exactly. And yeah. then, but then I learned, oh, wait a second, this is high ground. What's happening? You know, so then I learned about, I learned about, about other, what Daniela is talking about. Exactly. And the, the film includes the historic, but also goes into the other questions, you know, that that Daniela is talking about. Certainly. That's no, that's that's it's really interesting. And, and uh, uh, one of the people in the documentary, uh, of course, is Aaron McKinney who has a really unique perspective. Um, Aaron, so you take on the perspective of someone who works in real estate development, but you work also as a community advocate, someone who cares deeply about what uh, Liberty Square and Liberty City actually need. So one question I have for you is, from your unique point of view, what are those critical considerations? What do you think Liberty Square and Liberty City really need to, to be able to thrive? Yeah, understood, and thanks for the question. So. I would just say first and foremost, one of the most important things is when you look at these revitalization efforts and these uh, redevelop redevelopment efforts that are happening in Liberty City and similar communities, I think the first step is you know legitimate and intentional planning for the promises that these type of developments or these type of projects are promoted to achieve, right? And so it's not just putting things on paper, it's being more intentional about you know partnerships, timelines, and so forth, because as mentioned in that that small clip that that was played just now, you know, when the face I have, I, I think what was presented in the plan that we talk about for Liberty Square, you know, is a reasonable plan, right? What we're we're originally essentially addressing is this deconcentration or this uh, economic desegregation that unfortunately far too many minority communities and these specific Black communities uh, tend to deal with, where folks are essentially disenfranchised, as Kachi mentioned, and not necessarily connected. To the larger community uh, to larger resources resources and opportunities that exist within those spaces and so the idea and, and then on top of that there, there are very little mechanisms in place to allow you know folks like me uh a a, a middle income earner a a uh, a middle class american to then you know move back into these spaces and help with that economic growth so the concept and nature of you know change a community by creating this diversity, the socioeconomic diversity is a great one. And I think um, it's all about intention and approach. And I, I can't stress that enough, right? Um, and in the absence of making moves to create that diversity, what we are essentially doing is perpetuating the same concentration of poverty over and over again in these communities. And I, what, I, what I mean by that is, you know, choosing to focus on, you know, strictly low income housing will never get us to achieve the revitalization efforts that the community deserves, right? Um, there has to be that mix involved. But if, what does that look like and how do you approach it? And so one of the things I think is like critical from a development standpoint is trying to find a way to avoid any adverse impact on 
historic community members, right? If we're looking at redevelopment, is there a chance for a phased approach where we can allow folks to stay in place as opposed to having to relocate to other communities, right? Because again, if we're talking about low income residents, the financial resources available to them are oftentimes more limited than most. So the disruption is bringing them to someone's life with the introduction of a, a move far beyond the spaces that they've known and grown and, and, and have become comfortable. Um, the need for uh, that, like I said, the added density to allow that, that mix where we're looking at finding ways to upzone some of these areas. And I know that's a controversial target uh, conversation considering you know, this conversation about preserving the historic nature of community. But listen, you're not building more land, right? So if you actually want to address the housing issue, you need to be able to densify certain areas and create that, again, that housing diversity that's needed. Um, you need property management that is culturally competent to deal with uh, folks that are in different housing types, right? Um, you say culturally competent. Culturally competent, yes. Um, that are aware of the historic issues of said areas um, that can speak to and connect with the people to make them more comfortable in these spaces because, you know, what we've heard about, uh, being in my experience, and also, you know, reading a recommendation by Katya, uh, uh, another book on integrating the inner city, there's oftentimes this disconnect with management where folks are made to feel like they're not at home in their own. And so it's, it's the little things along the way. And in addition to that, a, a legitimate real focus on providing the wraparound services and planning that's gonna help folks again to climb that socioeconomic ladder, right? The focus on providing opportunity for education attainment, for economic development, uh, for health and wellness opportunities and resources to be conveniently stationed within these, these newly built communities and these new structures. Um, and then the emphasis on arts and the preservation of the culture of the community. I mean, these are all critical components and without the proper planning, the actual pen to paper, the partnerships, the collaborations, the actual economic investment, you know, a lot of times these efforts will then miss the mark if they don't have that, that focus on the, the real needs of community. Yeah, it seems That's like so much of it comes to intention. Um, what is it you're trying to accomplish and how are you trying to accomplish it? One one thing that's really interesting to me, um, and I'm sure the audience agrees, is all of you have mentioned one particular concept, which is the concept of history and the role that history plays in all of what's going on moving forward and all that has happened um, since the, the, the project was first founded. So I'd like to, if we can, I'd like to just um, initiate a little clip it's a historical trailer from the film to give context to what uh, that history is. Right here, this is my house where I grew up, 1209 Northwest 64th Street. That was my bedroom window right there. There was a tree, mom always planted trees. All of this was trees and she always planted trees and flowers wherever she was. This is me in front of the mango tree. Cherries and mulberries and almonds and guavas. Avocados. Like paradise. <laughs> if you went uh, away you went downtown or you went on an errand, your house, you left your door unlocked. This was the kind of community that we had. Those were golden days, you know, golden days. Singing glory, hallelujah. So this was like a haven, and it was a pleasure to live in the project. Liberty Square was family. As a child, we didn't know we were poor because we had such a rich life. The neighborhood hotel became the social center of the South. Muhammad Ali had his victory party in this very cafe where I'm sitting when he beat Sonny Liston. Dr. Martin Luther King stayed here. Malcolm X, Jackie Robinson, Nancy Wilson stayed here. You know, that we could just go on with the names of, of celebrities who, when they performed on Miami Beach, could not live there. They had to come 
in the black community. When Liberty Square was um, initiated in October of 1936, the wall it was the message of breaking off of this neighborhood from the surrounding neighborhood, which was white on the other side. Segregated housing left the black communities largely underserved. No political representation whatsoever. So you have, you know, oftentimes very poor electrical services, very poor um, water management, almost no green space to speak of, underrepresentation in terms of educational questions. Um, and that leads to, again, a sense of disempowerment. The riots that emerged here in the 1960s, again in the 80s, multiple times, that problem was set in motion as early as the late 1930s with Liberty Square being in place. The concentration of poverty is really what then contributes further to the problems that the neighborhood faces in terms of drug and you know, vice industries, in terms of you know, liquor stores, again, in terms of overall danger to you know, young people. A former Miami Northwestern senior high student shot and killed. Four people shot The area has become known for its poverty drug use and gun violence. Miami's most dangerous neighborhoods. All right, so now that we have that context, um, I want to start with uh, Philip and Hattie. You guys have been working really, really hard and fighting hard to preserve the historic Liberty Square Community Center for some time now. I'm wondering um, if, we, if you could just give us a little bit about why that's important and what's the status of that fight now? Well, you know, <clears throat> the history is so great that when our organization, remember, we had started to, you know, we were doing things, but we jumped into real action and we were trying to let the people know and we were telling everybody this project was built in 37 it's it's the third project in the nation you know it, it's the first in the southern part and you know you don't have nothing like this in the black community to, to be proud of it's so strong i'm in my 70s and i'm telling you we we live in a hurricane state and my last child was born she wasn't my last, but she, she was born in 66. I went with my mom in the project because I knew I was safe. Now, mm -hmm. think about this. They got new buildings now, and one of them had a leak. I don't remember a roof coming off of Liberty Square. I don't no, remember a window being torn. Mm -hmm. So I, this is why my husband was so, he wanted to preserve the whole mm -hmm. Liberty Square. That would have been so beautiful to have it renovated and everything but you know the people were fooled that the tenants in the time and they were saying oh no we want nice buildings so we fought like the dickens and god blessed us with dave heritage trust to, to we, we uh provided them proof that it was worth saving and they the ones helped us to save they really the, did. the community center <clears throat> because the, st the state preservation uh historic preservation said don't touch that. That 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 ground is is historic. And then they came to us. Oh, we need you now. You know, they didn't say it yeah, like they that. Did well, they, they didn't say it like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> no. what, what happened when they found out that they couldn't do they they could not touch that property, mm -hmm. and then they came came to us, and I didn't. We really didn't want the, the people to think that we didn't want them to have anything new, but it wasn't about new. It was about the history of it, and. They didn't get it. Yeah. It was this. It was about the history. The, the project was was something that you can go to, and 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 just stay there. And it was it was it was like a a haven for you. You know, we can go to. It was no crime. You know, it, it's not that it, nobody didn't curse or, but it wasn't breaking in. No one house houses and. Very right, different place than it's. It, 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 I yeah. mean, you not only had your parents, you had the whole neighborhood of parents. So everybody was more respectable mm -hmm. because they knew that Miss Jane on mm -hmm. the corner was going to tell Daddy when he got home. Well, you and speaking of daddies, you had a lot of fathers in at that time. Right. It's not like a housing where the, 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 our absent parent, the, the, just a, a one, you know, the mother. You had a lot of fathers in that project. So that's the beautiful part mm -hmm. that I so, remember that. Of course. So what is the actual status of the Liberty Square Community Center now? Is it is it set to be preserved? 
Oh yes, I'm sorry. I was I, I cut myself short when Wonder I was that's giving, that's quite all right. I was giving credit to Dave Harris just how they came in and, and, and got up and we got up under their umbrella and they we fought together to save Liberty Square Community Center. We we I'm saying community center because we had a chance to be nasty and say, no, we want to preserve the whole thing. thing. But no, after the state came involved and, and let them know the builders. That no, this is this is holy ground. Not really. You know, you got to make sure the Indians not buried down there and all that kind of stuff. They really was very strict. Sure. So that's when we it, we have we have proof. We have it in writing where we signed off the builder, the uh, tenant association, uh, Dave Heritage, uh, the president, my husband. You know, we had um, housing director. Mm -hmm. Every you know, it's it's written in stone. Like they say, talk is cheap. That yeah. they cannot guess that it is preserved. Yes. Yeah. So That's that was the, that was the bottom line, and uh, we're now in the stage of waiting to uh, renovate it. You know. So right. that's that's the beautiful news that it won't be torn down. Yes, as you've already seen on the film, they already started. You know, tearing down. Yeah, it no, goes to show the power of 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 residents and and sticking together and being able to yes. try to accomplish something yes. sincere. Um, I, I do think there's an interesting, there's there's some parts of Liberty Square that are almost anachronistic. Um, a good example is the race wall. Katya, in, in the trailer that we just saw, uh, the good doctor talks about this race wall. Can you can you tell us a little bit about it and maybe like how people explain its presence today or how you maybe you were explained its presence or what have you? Yeah, that was one of my great embarrassments when I came back to Miami and learned about this wall that I realized all these years that I had been studying and living in Miami, I had never any idea about that this wall existed, you know, and um, it, when Liberty Square was built in, in 39, um, as we just learned, although it was in the middle of nowhere, pushed far inland, very few neighbors at that point, but those few white neighbors said, okay, if you build this colony here, we want a wall, we want a six foot wall. And that was their condition. So this wall was built. And um, I don't know exactly when, but it, it was then cut down. Maybe I don't know if somebody here on the call, I think it's not 100% clear really when they cut it down. Now it's like waist high, but there's still the remnants there. And again, I'm not quite sure, but I know recently and Hedy and Phil and uh, Philip and maybe Aaron or Daniela, I don't know when, but it recently got historic designation, the wall, right? Um, yeah. Right. Year or two years ago, finally, right? Mm -hmm. so that it, um, but it took a long time, and as far as I know, it's still not clear who's really, if the developer is taking care of it, who's who's taking care of it. So um, it's to be it's it's to be watched who will who will take care of this wall. And in, in my experience now over the last five six years, it is very. Um, <coughs> There's a lot of danger of historical places disappearing, you know, in, in Liberty. Yeah. They're being sold, the land is being sold, the building is being sold, and then, you know, it, it's, uh, it, is, uh, it, it gets uh, torn down. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm thinking about Georgette's tea room. I don't know what's happening with that. I'm, I'm thinking about, like, something like the pit where the, my, uh, you know, Miami base started, which is also historical, you know base yeah. of, of hip hop, you know, and um, just as a little aside, uh, as a companion piece for the documentary, we created, uh, our team created a virtual reality piece called Liberty City VR to exactly try to do this, to preserve, digitally preserve places that are uh, maybe gone already and also give importance so that maybe they don't have to disappear. So this is an, a second project that we're doing in terms of digital preservation, trying to really alert people to the to the wealth of history uh, of of Liberty City. That's that's rather fascinating um, concept of digital preservation in that context. That's that's really interesting. But I, I, I think it's also interesting how you're talking about moving forward. You're talking about what will happen. It kind of brings me to Aaron a little bit because Aaron, um, I, I, I do wonder to myself, and I'm sure a lot of our audience wonders, uh, being that you have understood the development industry, that you understand what's happening, that you look at it from a community advocacy point of view, um, what do you think would benefit the residents that are there now? 
how do you think that Liberty Square residents and um, former and future residents can actually be best served with what's happening on the ground? Yeah, um, so I, I would just almost for the most part re reiterate my, my previous point. I, I think what was presented on paper um, is a, a novel concept, a novel plan. Uh, and uh, sans the vouchers, but I'll, I'll get on that one in a second. Um, again, I just think this concept, again, of bringing in additional earners into the community, preserving those that are already there, and allowing for the build out of additional services and commercial activity is needed to help the community grow. Um, I mean, you know, naturally, Black unemployment trends higher than, than the national average. You know, youth unemployment, although trending downward, uh, you know, just under 10%, but among Black youth is usually closer to 13%. I mean, these are real challenges that create that are that create the byproducts that we read about and see in the news on a daily basis, right? The fact that folks are in in, in tough economic conditions, the fact that we don't have proper programming and activities for youth to then keep them engaged, right? So the jobs that come from these activities, the wraparound services to deal with the health disparities, the cancer clusters and such, having these that inclusion, that I'm sorry, that infusion of this new commercial activity, these new spaces, these new services within the community, I think will be critical to, again, improve, improving long-term outcomes for residents of Liberty Cities, but those that also you know, live on the outskirts. Now, thinking about folks that used to live there, and, um, and now get into the voucher piece for a second, because ideally, I understand the need or the, the, the concept behind, you know, giving up vouchers in these type of situations in these projects. And, you know, quite frankly, no one should be forced to live where they don't want to live simply because they're economic, uh, financially strapped, right? So that- Aaron, if I can ask you just to define vouchers for those in the audience who might not know yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So you have housing choice vouchers, project-based vouchers and such. These are essentially subsidies that come from uh, HUD, administered through the local housing authority that would have then uh, allow folks to rent on the market at fair market value. And similar to public housing, the idea is that the resident will only be responsible for paying no more than 30% of their income and the balance would then be covered by the voucher. And so we had a number of residents in Liberty Square that chose to, to take said vouchers. And you know, my preference would have been that it was a temporary thing that would you know, force, I hate to say force, but allow folks back in, not that they're not allowed now, but that would encourage them to come back in. Because my thing is, you know, why, why collect these series of anecdotes about the troubled dark days and not be able to reap the benefits of what's to come right and so i think there that folks should have been more encouraged to stay within the space um but for those that did choose to move off-site that have made that decision to remain permanent off-site residents and voucher holders you know one thing i would like to see is uh more support from the powers that be at our local housing authority to make sure that folks are actually, you know, doing okay or, or holding their ground or, or actually just fairing out in the marketplace. I mean, it, it's intimidating in Miami-Dade County to be on the private market. I say that as a, you know, a middle income earning college educated professional. And, you know, as someone who's still a renter here, it, it's tough. And so that additional support I think is always needed, but that's a major budgetary functions within, you know, government. And we can, that's a whole nother conversation about where we place priorities in regards to our investments. But I think there needs to be more oversight there to ensure that folks are gonna be taken care of long-term. And then one last point I will put out there, and I guess this kind of goes back to the point that Yellow made earlier about the rising cost of, you know, what's called affordable housing, really sure affordability. Um, and, you know, one remember she didn't make is about public housing residents being forced out. And again, HUD guidelines and the way those rules work is that their their income is, is always going to be capped. Oh, sorry, their rent payments are going to be capped at 30% of AMI. What I feel the issue really comes into play is when we think about affordable housing, right? The the, the typical um, tax credit, you know, uh, bond deal programs that exist to subsidize these income restricted housing developments. And the reason I say that is because of how we go about setting rental rates within these programs. Everything is based on the area median income for that jurisdiction. And so in Miami-Dade County, um, where we have a median income of 68,000, and that's due, generally due to the fact we have a huge income disparity, that doesn't necessarily speak to the median income of an area like Liberty City. And so when rental rates are set to be affordable to those that are at that 60% of area median income mark, where does that leave a person that lives in Liberty City, in Overtown, in Little Haiti, 
that even with those lower marks below market, those lower uh, risk rates below market, it's still way out of touch for them. So, you know, and again, this is a larger issue, maybe more federal, I mean, it requires more subsidies involved, but I would like to see how there can be more brainstorming around trying to make sure that those that are moving into these, again, not just in Liberty City, but these, these affordable housing developments mm -hmm. that are below the mark, that aren't public housing residents, but are at about 30, 40% of area median income, that we create opportunities for affordability to them, for them within those new spaces as well. Yeah, there's this interesting um, kind of like overlap of uh, private industry and government, it seems. And like, and, and the way that you solve this or the way that you can tackle this um, always is going to involve, at least it seems to me, it's going to involve uh, kind of like that overlap. Um, Daniela, you have a, a great deal of experience dealing with uh, city elected officials, so on and so forth, and kind of trying to um, advocate for affordable public housing, especially in a place like Miami, which um, just last April uh, was, you know, declared a affordable housing crisis. Um, what do you think is the role of city and elected officials in addressing climate gentrification in the housing crisis in Miami? Well. As we look at our elected leaders, the role is to make certain that they do all things to protect the lives of their constituents. So safety to life matters should always be priority as well as equitable economic development. And far too often, it seems as though both of those priorities are absent of the real needs of the people of that area. So oftentimes you will find um, developments or projects that are coming into the areas that have no input from the community um, and it still happens. Notification is not sanctioned and required to go to renters but guess what? That development that's coming is in an area that is heavily populated by renters or transient community who has no knowledge, no input, no say so, no voice in the process and no action as it relates to community benefits agreement. So all that is happening um, at the same time with people who we elect to represent us. So I would always say that there is more that can be done and it needs to be done equitably as we move forward to protect the legacy of our communities. What is coming into our communities oftentimes is not um, a reflection of the current population. Um, it, it actually serves not a, enough of a purpose for the people that live there. So, and I say that because you have an area of Liberty City, Liberty Square, that has a need for quality child care facilities. Those are some things that should be designed and built and funded for the people of that area. The same way where it comes to health care, quality and accessible health care facilities. And also in the Liberty Square area, we need access to food. That's a food desert. Liberty Square is the top of the line when it comes to a food desert. So we need things that will provide um, clean, um, green, accessible, and affordable food. So when it comes to what is being built, designed, and advanced in communities such as Liberty Square, Liberty City, it's not oftentimes what the people who live there truly need. And that's what we're calling on elected officials to do more of. Be more, as Aaron mentioned, be more intentional about what is actually going to come into, into those communities so that people have an opportunity to not only live there, but to thrive. And, and I would also say that when it comes to programs that are being federally funded to advance housing, um, there is um, 
some regulations that call for family self-sufficiency. Elected officials need to make certain that through those housing authorities, that there is commitment to making certain that those family self-sufficiency plans and authorizations are put in place so that those who have lived in communities that have been deprived, deprived economically, have an opportunity to be self-sustaining families. I see. Um, that That's an interesting, so just so we're all clear, the audience, we're going to start, I'm going to start reaching into the audience questions and just kind of throwing them at you guys as I see them. Um, <clears throat> but that's an interesting point for a question that I think Aaron might have some insight into. Aaron, there's a question here that says, in, uh, in the development, who is it that oversees accountability for plans and intentions? Like, how does that function? So it, it all depends on the type of development. So, you know, since we're on the topic of, of Liberty Square, I mean, this was, you know, something that was a, a collective effort between developer and the local housing authority. So, I mean, they had standards of what they wanted to see included. It, it included a series of community meetings about, mm -hmm. the impact, about what they want to see in said development. And at that point, once, you know, crafting an RFP to kind of speak to the terms of the county's desires, some desires of community, uh, after, this, after a series of meetings, uh, there then was a, a RFP developed to allow folks to bid and, and then uh, propose their plans for the project site. But, you know, where I, where I become more concerned, again, going back to the point I made towards the, the tail end of, of uh, the, the last time you allowed me to speak, was more so concerned about ensuring that the housing agencies that are responsible for administering these RFPs, that have the site control of these lands, that are working with these developers are adequately staffed to then ensure that, you know, again, what the commitments are, are actually followed through. And right. I think, you know, working in my experience in Miami-Dade County Public Housing Community Development, I think I've met some amazing people in that shop that work extremely hard. They, they have a, a very uh, demanding, hardworking chief um, that demands excellence of them. And I've seen these people really, really push hard. But at the end of the day, there's only so much you can do, right? And so, if folks are stretched in and it can only take one so much, naturally things are going to slip through the cracks. And unfortunately, in this situation, that could be the promises of services and programming or even how a development is supposed to function that at that point, because no one's looking, you know, there's a possibility of, you know, getting away with murder, so to speak. So, yeah. you know, I think I, it's critical to have proper uh, oversight in the development. I hear you. Um, no, it's, it's it's an interesting question. Um, we, we have a, a second question coming. I'd like to actually pose this to Katya. Um, Katya, you have spent years at this point in Liberty City working, uh, recording, uh, meeting people, having conversations. How have you seen Liberty City adapt to sea level rise? Um, let, if you allow me, I would I would like to jump on uh, what impact that what I'm what I'm hoping the film uh, you know ha what kind of impact we're hoping to sure. achieve with the with the film if you allow me um, because it it also goes to what Dan Daniela and and Aaron uh, were saying you know we um, we we have an, a unique uh, chance with this film because the film will come out on PBS next year when there are three of maybe four blocks of nine will be done so this film can affect the hopefully positively affect the development directly by maybe challenging the the ones in charge to follow through with their commitments you know something that aaron just mentioned we also would like to really uh, uh, change the way people maybe see the residents of liberty square support a, a growing movement of of um young black leaders uh, who are working to build their their power and de determine the fate of their own neighborhood? Um, we want to establish that climate gentrification is real, you know, which is still a debate at, uh, among some some people, and add to the growing sense of urgency nationally and internationally to address the crisis of sea level rise and climate uh, change in general. You know that and the and the disproportional impact that that has on um poor people and people of color you know um, certainly. um it, no certainly and and in the in the uh pursuit of that goal have you seen the uh the people in the documentary that the documentary seeks to support and elevate 
have you have you seen them kind of move to adapt to this reality of climate gentrification? I mean, it, they're fighting it. Somebody like Valencia mm. or everybody, you know, Daniela, they have, you know, yeah. people are fighting it. It's, you know. Yeah, so that's that might be an interesting question to pose to Daniela. Daniela, how do you see that fight going? And what do you think is the future of adapting to that? Uh, maybe not adapting to the force, but rather pushing against it, right? So as it relates to what, climate gentrification? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> okay. Oh, yeah. So definitely want to give, you know, kudos and shout out to the work that's being done um, within our community and across this nation from Val Valencia Gunder and her team um, for really kind of putting us on the map to say, hey, y'all better wake up and pay attention. Climate gentrification is real and it is here. Um, because we live in the highest point of elevation um, as it relates to climate change, sea level rise, <clears throat> and justification. Um, but because we're such in the struggle, and I say that because the area of Liberty Square has a high population of renters, I don't know if that's on top of mind um, for many people who live there. And I mean, I get it. We need to be forward thinking to preserve and protect our communities. Um, but because we're such in a struggle just to survive day to day, um, you know, that's not something that's top of mind. So we do always um, look to um, those who are presenting the information and resources so we can keep ourselves um, well versed on it. Um, but I can say that more work there is more, definitely more work that needs to be done so that we can be, um, you know, better prepared to address um, and defend um, those who are coming into our communities, purchasing the land where we live and then turning around and marking it up, you know, five times how, um, higher that, you know, prices us out of that area. So it's, it's a real thing that's happening. Um, it impacts our human rights. It impacts our civil rights. But it's something that, um, you know, is not um, top of mind for many people because we are already experiencing being priced out. We're already experiencing being disenfranchised. And we're already experiencing not having shelter. So that is something that we're still um, working towards to get, you know, more people um, to be aware of it and how we can come together as a collective to address it. Right. It seemed like Hattie had something she wanted to yes. add. Oh. I wanted to share when you were saying, you know, what are people doing about, you know, the gentrification? I can remember a couple of years back. Um, he was a commissioner of the city then, Commissioner Harmon, and he was saying, he was telling the people, don't sell your houses, your house is valuable, you know, and, and a lot of them was trying to figure out, well, what is he talking about? So people are beginning to talk about it, and I was glad that he did that, because you have a lot of surrounding houses around Liberty Square that they're trying to buy out. So yes, people are talking about it more and more, and on the news, they keep showing the sea level on Miami Beach, how this water came in so many inches and stuff. And I say, you watch the news. So it is being talked about and trying to sink into people's heads who has who have homes or, or whatever around that area that this is you living on a gold mine. That's what he was telling. That's me. exactly what that. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to add. Surely. I'm, I'm going to try and sneak in two questions real fast. And the first the, the this first one's going to be to Hattie and Philip. What do you think the lessons are of the struggles that you've had with your nonprofit and being able to preserve as much as you can of the space? What lessons would you pass on to other communities dealing with the same problem? What comes to my mind first is that you have to stick together. I mean, when you when you when you feel strongly about something, sometimes people are afraid to speak out for whatever reason, but it's it's worth the fight. Because, you know, you don't gain it. Nobody's not going to put it on a platter. And then sometimes you have to do your own research. We began to research. We didn't know what we was doing, going to the library, reading up on everything. And I wanted to add about the wall when you were saying about that. I saw a beautiful called wall in project that the kids did. I don't want to talk too much about it because it hasn't been implemented. But they need to put that 
right on the wall and the sidewalk. That would even make Liberty Square more beautiful. And our organization has told them, we're, we're here to fight with you to, to make sure that that wall implementation comes in because that's a project in itself. So even now, we still we still have a fight within Liberty Square. And and I told him, don't put my name on nothing. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> no, over. Okay. Right. We don't but then we don't put your name on. I no, said, don't put my name nowhere. It. But sticking but together other, seems to be big. Yes, but for <laughs> other, for other communities, you know, and and I, I share it with people. You know, I said, I'm not a. I forget what they say I was. I said, I'm just. I just speak from my heart, you know, and and just go for it and be sincere because it'll come off when you're talking to someone if if you're trying to run a game or not. Of so course. no matter what the project is, even I think Lincoln Field, we were talking about they had a wall on that side. Nobody talked did. about they that wall. Right. You know, yeah. so yeah. So um I just I just I know it's not sometimes it's not, not easy, but it's worth the fight. You know, anything you get is worth the fight. Yes, it is. And a last question um, for Katya. Katya, where can we watch this film that has driven all of this conversation? Can you tell us a little bit about <laughs> getting in touch with it, watching it? Where can we follow? Yes. So we we just we're just finishing it as we speak. We're doing all the technical finishing, and we're we're premiering it uh, beginning of next year. On we're gonna do some festival tours, and then it will be on PBS on Independent Lens. Um, I don't have the exact date, but we have a website with all the that where we will update where you can see the film. www is the title of the film raising a z raising liberty square dot com, and there will be all the the information. And we will have we are planning a lot of community screenings also all over the country. With the Very film. good. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much for being on this panel, our wonderful audience, and our wonderful hosts. Uh, I hope everyone's enjoyed this session and uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.